Hi guys, welcome to Introduction to Rust. My name is Tensor. The next few videos will be projects that use all of the stuff that we've learned thus far. In this video, we're going to talk about the test suite that Rust has. We're going to be talking about conditional compilation, and we're going to be talking about attributes. So when you create a new cargo library project, this is what you'll get inside of your lib.rs. The reason why we get this automatically generated is so that we can start doing test-driven development. Now, of course, library projects do not have main functions, so the way that we can test their functionality rather than putting it inside of a main function is by calling tests. If you were to jump into your terminal and just type in cargo test, you'll see here that it will run the automatically created test called it works, and it will of course pass because there's nothing inside of the test itself. All right, so let's break down what's going on here. First, we have what is called an attribute, and this has a CFG flag, which means it's a conditional compilation flag. So the CFG annotation actually stands for configuration. CFG links over to what's called conditional compilation, and we conditionally compile this code based on the configuration. That means that this entire block here, from where this uh, attribute appears to the uh, end of the scope here, will only compile when we call the test suite because we've labeled it with test. So then we have mod tests, and we've already talked about the module system, so we're creating a sub-module inside of our main.rs file here. And then we've got another attribute here that's just called test, and this basically tells the compiler that this function itself is a part of the test suite. So attributes are metadata about pieces of Rust code. For instance, the derive attribute is one example that we've seen quite a bit. To make a test function, we just add this test attribute to the line before the fn declaration. Now, of course, we can run our tests with cargo tests as we just saw, and Rust builds the test runner binary that runs the functions annotated with test attributes, and then reports whether or not the test passes or fails. Now, our test suite has access to the test attribute. It also has various macros that we can call inside of it, and it also has a should panic attribute that we can use. So consider this example here. We've created a new function annotated with test called check2. Inside of it, we're running a macro called assert, and we're checking to see if 1 plus 1 is equal to 2. The assert macro is provided by the standard library. It's useful when you want to ensure some condition in a test evaluates to true. We give the assert macro an argument that evaluates to a Boolean. So in this case, we have a Boolean here. It'll either be true or false. If the value is true, the assert does nothing and the test passes. So in this case, this will be true. So it'll do nothing and it will pass. However, if we pass the value of false to our assert macro, then it will call a panic, which will then cause the test to fail. So for this case, this will panic because three is not equal to four and it will cause the test to fail. So let's take a look at that. So we ran our test. You'll see here that it says running three tests. It says test, tests, check two, test, tests, it works, and then test, test, test three. And you'll see that the first two we get okay and then the last one we get failed. And then it tells us what the failures are. So it says uh, thread panicked at assertion failed. So it tells us exactly where it failed, and this is because of the assertion macro. So because 3 does not equal 4, the assertion macro was given false, and then it called the panic macro, which then forced the program to panic. And then, of course, down here, we get our test result where we say failed, and we say two passed, one failed, zero ignored, zero measured, etc. In addition to being able to check that our code returns true assertions, we can also check that our code handles error conditions as we expect. So for instance, if we actually want this test to fail, then we can add another attribute here called should panic. And you write should panic underneath of the test attribute here. And what this tells the compiler is that this should panic and that that is actually a pass for us. And you'll see here if we run cargo test again, we get three passing tests. The should panic attribute goes after the test attribute and before the test function. This attribute makes the test passed if the code inside the function panics and the test will fail if the code inside the function doesn't panic. So there are a lot of cases inside of code where we want to check, say, the error handling. And if the error handling isn't working properly, maybe a bug is getting through, then obviously we want to check that as well. For instance, if I turn this into a true statement, so 3 equals 3, then you'll see now that this test will now fail. And there we go. It says here, test, test 3 failed. 
and then we get our failures here. All right, now let's consider these examples. So we've got multiple public functions here. We have a add to function, which just adds two to a, another function here. So another function called internal adder, which just adds two numbers together. Then we've got a greeting function here, which then just passes a reference to string inside of a format macro here and then returns it as a string. And then we've got our test suite down here. And then you'll see here that we've got this new line here that says use super. And then of course we've got an asterisk after it. So because we're inside of an inner module, we need to bring the code under the test in the outer module into the scope of the inner module. In order to run any of these functions, we need to actually bring them inside of this module scope. Now, of course, we've chosen to use a glob here, but you could specifically reference uh, certain functions if you wanted to. And the glob, of course, will bring in anything that we define up here. We also have a new macro right here called assert EQ. So assert EQ compares two arguments for equality and they'll print out the two values if the assertion fails. So it's easier to see why the test failed in this case rather than just simply using assert. The assert macro only tells us if we got a false value for the expression, not the values that led to that false value. Whereas the assert EQ Q macro will show us uh, the values that fail. So this can be advantageous for us in specific cases. We run our tests here and all of them pass perfectly fine. So now let's make them fail. So this puts in four and then this adds up to four. So it returns four and four. And if four and four equals four, then uh, assert EQ will pass. Let's make this five. So it'll be five and four. Obviously this won't pass now. So you can see here it says thread test. It works. Panicked at assertion failed. Left equals right. And then it says left is five and right is four. And then it gives us the line in the code where the actual four came from. So again, this is pretty useful for uh, checking for equality and allowing us to find out where exactly this error came from. So in this case, it's referencing the internal adder function up here, telling us that this is not correct and that the five is also not correct. We also have another macro called assert NE, which does the exact opposite of assert EQ. So this checks for inequality. So in this case, this will actually pass now because five is not equal to four here. All right, now consider this next example down here. We are making a variable binding and we are calling our greeting function up here with the name Carol inside of it. And of course this returns a string that will say, hello, Carol. And then we're going to assert that the result itself contains the name Carol inside of it. So this should return as true as uh, hello, Carol should have Carol in it. But for instance, if we uh, make this a lowercase c, it should then panic for us. All right, so you'll see here that it fails and it says that it does not contain Carol. So we can also add a custom message to be printed out with the failure message as an optional argument to assert, assert EQ or assert any, any arguments specified after the two required arguments to assert or the two required arguments to assert EQ or assert any are passed along to the format macro and then converted to a string. Custom messages are obviously useful in order to document what the assertion means in the context of the code so that if the test fails, we have a better idea of what a, the problem actually is. All right, so we've modified our greeting contains name test here. And you can see here that we have a new set of arguments inside of our assert macro. So we're still checking to see if the result contains Carol, but if it does fail, then we have this large error message that returns where it says greeting did not contain name, value was, and then we can pass back the value itself. So if we change, for instance, our result equal to max here, then we will actually see that it will fail. And then it'll say greeting did not contain the name, value was max max. And you can see here that we did in fact get our error message where it said greeting did not contain name value was hello max. So we can use this type of format to interpolate our string and then send back values that may not be strings and see what they actually look like inside of the test suite. So we can also call specific tests. So if we do not want to run the entire test suite, we can just call one of our tests. For instance, say we just want to call greeting contains name. We can then just run cargo test and then specify the test that we want to run. It just ran the one test greeting contains name. And of course this still failed because we have max in there instead of carol 
All right, so let's talk a little bit more about this conditional compilation attribute. So in this case, our conditional compilation will only compile the code inside of this little uh, module if we run our cargo test file. So if we were to compile our application normally, it'll just leave out this code here. That way we don't have to worry about our tests slowing down the size of our runtime. We can use this feature in other cases. We have our conditional compilation attribute here, and we're saying if target OS equals Linux, then this function will be compiled and it will get run. So if our target OS is not Linux in this case, then this function will be compiled. And then in our main function here, we're saying first run are you on Linux? And this will choose the function that will run uh, based on the actual target OS that we're on. So because we're on Windows, this function here will not actually get compiled at all. Rather than having to worry about the two functions having the same name, we can just leave this out by using this CFG attribute. And then we also have a CFG macro here. We're saying target OS equals Linux, and we want to print this else. Otherwise, we want to print this out. In this case, this entire thing will still compile, but it will uh, automatically tell us that we're not on Linux. So you see here we run it, and you see here it says not running Linux. Check OS again, not Linux. Now this type of feature is extremely powerful and it can be extremely useful for command line tools. Imagine you want to make a command line tool that works with a Windows operating system and also works on a Unix operating system. Obviously the file systems are different on the two systems. Unix has various tools that Windows does not and they both have tools that have various different names. As a result of this we can use our CFG here to make it so that we have different code that runs on each operating system. And we can make sure for instance that the Unix code will not compile on the Windows system and the Windows code will not compile on the Unix system, which will ultimately make our program faster. So we also have other various attributes. For instance, we have this allow attribute and we can pass in dead code. This function obviously is useless, but uh, we don't want the linter to come out and say it's useless in this case. So we can pass this in to control how our linter actually treats our code. You'll see here they're running this. We do not get any warnings back that say that the function is empty and doesn't do anything. Whereas if we were to remove that attribute, we would actually get some warnings. So there are many other attributes inside of Rust that we can gain access to. And we'll talk about the attributes as we go into our projects from here on. All right, guys. Well, I hope you enjoyed this tutorial. If you did, feel free to subscribe and like. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them in the comment box below. And if you disliked it, then by all means, downvote it as much as you like. Have a good day.